Hello, and thank you for tuning in to The Christian Skeptic. I'm your host, Sean Kerwin, and as always, it's my mission to take an honest look at our questions about Christianity through the lens of logic and reason. I'm not here to preach to you, just to start a conversation with you. I hope you enjoy the show. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off from the last episode. And if you haven't listened to that one, it was a part one to the part two that I am about to do, which is, does the Bible oppress women? And there's kind of a large question that I didn't really answer in the last episode. I alluded to, but I didn't answer it. And that question is, can women be pastors? It's 2023, and... A lot of women are pastors, and so I think the question of can, is it possible for women to be pastors has already been answered before us, because a lot of different denominations and sects of Christianity have women as pastors and priests all over the world. But there's this there's this verse that Paul writes to Timothy in his first letter to Timothy, in the second, what we've divided up as chapter, and what we've divided up as the second verse, where he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Paul speaking specifically to pastoral ministry, to Timothy, his young pastor protege taking over the church at Ephesus. So let's just get into the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this is not necessarily going to be a, a verse by verse, line by line Bible study, but I think it's important that we really see what Paul is saying to Timothy and how that lines up with what we know of culture, church life, and where we're at in 2023. Therefore, verse 1 says of 1 Timothy chapter 2, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or, girl or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So there you have it. Paul just wants women barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. Uh, thanks for tuning into the show today, right? No, no. <laughs> I'm kidding, obviously. Um, that's not what it says. Um how do we okay okay so how do we know that because at, at face value that is kind of what it says but then it's kind of in conflict too because paul wrote in a letter to the church of corinth he instructed in first corinthians chapter 11 both men and women to quote unquote pray and prophesy in the church setting and and then so okay pray and prophesy right what does that have to do with pastoral well he kind of gives an order um, to the church order, I guess, and and this is important, and this is why organized religion is important too, because if you don't have organization and order to a structure, well, then you get into this wildly chaotic and offensive place that you don't want to be in. And so order is really important to understand what's going on, right? But so just one chapter later, just a few verses later in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says that prophecy is the highest and most authoritative gift of the Holy Spirit outside of apostleship. So outside of being one of those called and sent apostles of Christ. So he says, first apostles, second prophets, and third teachers. 
And that's interesting. It's the didasko in the Greek word that we're seeing here. That is the same word that's used in 1 Timothy chapter 2, which is to teach and to have authority. And so let's just do it. Let's just look at the Greek, right? So didasko or didasko you as how it's used here in first timothy and forgive my pronunciation i am not greek um and to usurp authority authenteo is what's used in first timothy chapter two and that's very interesting it's not that paul is saying women can't teach and women can't have authority the bible and culture was actually very full of women having authority at that time so we can just start with the Bible, uh, for one, and even going back to the Old Testament, <laughs> this is this is kind of funny because the first person to ever name God, ever give God a name, other than Elohim or Yahweh, is a slave girl named Hagar. Right? If you you remember the story, I'm sure, but. Abram and Sarai have been given this promise by God that he'll be the father of many nations, that through their seed, the salvation of the world will come. And God, in Genesis 15, gives Abraham uh, gives Abram a vision, which basically says he's going to fulfill that promise himself, that there's nothing Abram has to do to fulfill this promise, right? It's, it's a very different picture from from religion, which says, do this certain thing, be this certain way, be this certain person, be from whatever, and, and then the gods will bless you. God says, no, I've given you this promise, and I'm going to make good on it regardless of what happens. And so so he does that, but then, but then no child ever comes, and so Abram and Sarai get impatient, and Sarai's just like, take my, take my handmaiden, take, take my female slave Hagar, and have a child through her, and so he does, and then like, that was a terrible idea, because all of this drama, this marital, this relationship, this jealousy drama ensues between Sarai and, and Hagar, and so Hagar flees into the wilderness because Sarai's just angry and, and you know, basically wishes her dead, and, and who knows, maybe there was more conflict that's not in the text, but either way, she runs out into the wilderness and is just ready to die, her and, and this child, Ishmael, with her, and God sees her, and then she says, you are El Roy, the God who sees me. And that's the first time in the entire Bible that we see someone giving God a name, such as the God who sees, the God who provides, right? And, and, and we see these names throughout the Bible, but the first time is a slave girl. And so the Bible never gets at or assumes that men have more access to God than women. And to even use Paul's example, of going back to creation, Adam and Eve, the Bible never says Adam walked with God and then taught Eve <laughs> who God was. The Bible says Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. So there isn't a spiritual exclusivity that's different among the genders there. And moreover, there isn't an exclusivity that forbids women to have authority over men, period. Obviously, we go back to the Torah, and for the first time ever in human history, Moses gives the command, as we talked about last time, to teach women how to read. And not only that, but to teach them how to read and then teach their children how to read. And that's in the Ten Commandments, right? Children, honor your father, period, right? No, no, no. Honor your father and mother. And so it implies that the mother has authority over children, both male and female. In Exodus, we're introduced to Miriam, who has authority. In Judges, we're introduced to Deborah, who leads a nation and has authority. In 1 Samuel, we have Hannah, who has this direct access to God and is the mother of Samuel, the prophet himself. In Ruth, we have a, a, a courageous woman leading an older woman, too. And so there's also something where the Bible doesn't say you can only have authority over younger, because because that can be an objection too, right? Okay, so the Bible says mothers can have authority over children, right? But it doesn't anywhere say that a younger woman can have authority or lead or teach or instruct or guide an older woman. 
Well, but, but then enter Ruth <laughs> and she does that, right? It, Ruth through her life guides and is an example to Naomi. And then, oh my gosh, Esther, right? Uh, becomes queen of a pagan nation of all of Persia and saves her people, has the authority to save her people. And so, it's not saying that women don't have authority at all. And it's not saying that women can't teach. Because as I just mentioned, Deborah, in Judges, taught the nation. The word prophetess is not absent from the Bible, as women can teach. And as I just mentioned, Paul even kind of holds prophecy over teaching in a church setting. And so, okay, <laughs> that was a lot. Um, but what is being said here? Because then, okay, we have other passages like I mentioned last time, 1 Corinthians 11, where it says every wife who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. And we kind of talked about that last time, so I'm not going to dive too much into that. Uh, but in Titus chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul says, Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so... If you, if you ever attend seminary, work at a church, you're a pastor, you know that there are three pastoral epistles that are directly presented as Paul training up young men to take over the position of pastor and church leader. And that's First and Second Timothy and Titus. And so right there in Titus, chapter 2, verse 3, older women are likewise be reverent behavior, not slanders, nor slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. So, okay, <laughs> so Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And then in a, the, a, a very another pastoral epistle, epistle, Paul says, hey, older women are to teach, right? We know from New Testament, Old Testament, women can have authority. That's not a sin. And so what do we do then? Do we just throw 1 Timothy 2 out and say, well, you know, Timothy was a pastor in Ephesus. And we know that Ephesus was prone to a pagan form of worship where women had authority in the worship system, right? Where, where not only that, but we also had temple prostitutes. And that is a major stumbling block. And so let's just write this off culturally and say, well, <laughs> you know, Paul is saying what the Bible is saying elsewhere, which is to say, if you're my people, says the Lord, right, you're, you're, you're to be holy. Like, like God wants his representatives on earth to be set apart, which is really what the word holy means, right? To be, to be different, to be set apart in a way that correlates enough a, a righteous or a right relatedness standing between God and man. And so if that has to look countercultural, if, if that has to be like, hey, women, don't <laughs> braid your hair, um, don't wear gold or pearls or costly clothing, and that's a way that you can look holy because somehow that's less offensive than saying women could, can't teach and have authority over a man, right? And, and it's like, okay, well, well, what do we mean there? Well, we also have to consider, and, and this is something culturally, right, that, that we should consider, uh, because it's just two verses earlier, that Ephesus culturally was a hub for trade. If you look on a map, like, it's, it's pretty close to the sea, and so you have, you have a melting pot there, really, and, and you have a, a show. You, you have a way that you can walk out into the marketplace and encounter a bunch of strangers and impress them right away, like immediately. And you can do that by how you dress. And, and you can do that by what you wear and the colors and the materials of what you wear. And it's, I mean, there's not much difference in our day and age today. And so what is Paul saying? He's saying, don't concern yourself with that. And he's, not necessarily saying don't ever wear gold, pearls, or braid your hair, because that's kind of weird to say never do that. He's saying don't adorn yourself, but adorn yourself like a godly person would with good works. And, and, and so what he's saying, and this applies to men and women, 
<laughs> especially now in 2023, where we have mega church pastors who spend $2,000 on a single outfit of skinny jeans and a leather jacket and some ironic hipster beard, right? <laughs> And they'll get up on stage and you notice, man, you freaking notice how good they look, right? Or these worship leaders that have these $2,500, $3,000, $5,000 outfits. And it's like, wow, they certainly look cool and hip. I, that will make me pay attention more or whatever to their message. And it's like, that's actually not modest. Because there's this idea in our kind of modern culture that modesty just means don't show skin. But really to the Bible, modesty meant don't adorn yourself with this kind of clothing to impress others. Don't adorn yourself with fashion trends as a part of somehow your identity. Don't let your church be represented as cool because you're wearing the right clothes. That's what Paul was getting at there, right? And so, and, and that's different. And so do we take that same cultural kind of context and say, well, when you look at Ephesus, I mean, women really were a bit more rebellious towards men in that culture. Women really would speak out more and disrupt more in worship culture because that was just kind of how it was. And so maybe Paul's just saying, don't do that. Let's have all reverence to the word. Let's have all reverence to the teaching. And what Paul is saying there doesn't necessarily apply to us today because that was then <laughs> and, and this is now. And Look at the past couple hundred years. I mean, women only got the right to vote in America in 19-whatever or something, right? Maybe. But maybe not. And, and I think that that's a dangerous line of thought and reasoning to kind of take with that because, well, Paul is saying something. But, like, really, though, Paul is saying something, and it shouldn't be overlooked. And when we look at the, the tense of the Greek words that Paul is using here, it's a gnomic present tense, which we don't really have in English, um, but, but it's kind of a at any time tense, so to say. And so the tense of the words that Paul's using here isn't him saying right now, Timothy, I don't want women to teach or have authority over men. And also don't separate those, which is what I just did at the start of this episode, right? To, to separate those and say, teach or. Because what, what Paul is really saying here, like if we look at the Greek, he's saying, I permit not. And then everything after the not is what he doesn't permit. And that's a woman to teach or have, a, nor have authority over the man. And, and so we can't separate those two things. And so to teach and to have authority then, also we're considering Paul's background as a Pharisee. That kind of language was often used of the priests in the synagogue. And we know that in the synagogue there was a separation between men and women. There was a court of the of the men, a court of the women, and then a court of the Gentiles. There's a lot of separation in the synagogue. And Paul's already broken down that separation. Jesus has already broken down that separation. Paul specifically says there is neither slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, man nor woman, <laughs> um, barbarian nor Scythian, but all are one in Christ Jesus. So, so there's no separation. Men and women are gathered together now in the religious setting, which is very different from Judaism, and yet there's still a prohibition for women to teach or have authority over men. So he's saying something here, and we can't overlook it. And so what does that mean? <laughs> that, well, well, it means something, right? Like, it can't not mean something. So can women be pastors? Here's my answer. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I know you've, you've already made it, you know, whatever, minutes into this episode. And, and my answer is I don't know if women can be pastors or not. But there's something there. There's something there that we need to be watchful of. And, and I think we need to figure out what we mean by pastor when answering this question. And I think that's, that's really the key and the kicker because different denominations have kind of different definitions of pastors. You see, I was a pastor myself 
in a church that identifies as non-denominational, but as we've moved through culture, and this church was, you know, 30 years old at this point, when the church was founded, it was non-denominational. But as we've moved through culture, I would say that a lot of the doctrine governing this church, and, and it was a Calvary church, so think about the Calvary movement, think about Chuck Smith, think about tear up the carpets, <laughs> you know, that, that, that was his famous thing, right? Like, oh, the hippies are coming in barefoot in California and they're ruining our carpets. And he was like, tear up the carpets, let them come. And it's like, right on, right? <laughs> because it's like, what matters more, carpet or someone's soul? And obviously someone's soul matters more than carpet. But that's the kind of movement that, that came out of that. And there's a very high regard for, for pastors like Charles Spurgeon, who, you know, now if you ask probably the average seminary grad, they'll probably say Charles Spurgeon is, is a uber-conservative, theologically Calvinist, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Theology shifts and moves weirdly, as, as everything in culture shifts and moves weirdly right now. And so in the background that I came from, having that, there, there was a very strict, again, Spurgeon-like reverence for the office of pastor. And it's like right on, because I, I think... I think there's something there. Having observed pastors, men and women, um, for the past decade now in our culture, and observing affairs and infidelity and abuse and financial horrors that go on, um, gender aside, I think most people shouldn't be pastors. Like... <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm offending you, but I'm also not that sorry. But, but like, really, and, and I think that there's something that, that the Catholics have, right, when they forbid priests to marry. And I'm not saying that pastors shouldn't be allowed to marry, so, so don't mishear me now, but I'm saying that there's something so demanding, so draining, so perplexing about the office of pastor that, that to do it correctly, it requires literally everything of your being to do it. And I also think, and this is just a side bonus, I know I'm already over on the usual time that, that we, we do for these, these episodes, but, but hear me out on this. I think if you want to be a pastor, you should not be a pastor. And I'll admit, there's, there's a bias there for me, that I, my training before I was a pastor was in engineering, not in ministry. And there's a bias with the the uh, devotion to the teaching of Charles Spurgeon, the, which I, I, I am, and I'll admit. Because he had this, this idea that if someone came to him and said, I want to be a pastor, he would do everything in his power to absolutely discourage that person from being a pastor. And he said, listen, if you're actually a real pastor, the world's going to do everything in its power to try to beat you down, discourage you, and strip you of that position. So he's like, if I can do it as a loving pastor, then you're not called. <laughs> it's like fair enough but but i think that that's true i think that you should be good like really good at something else maybe even multiple things m multiple different career paths multiple different endeavors in life you should have the ability to go out and, and, and my friend Stephen christian and i talked about this on our episode but as a pastor you should have the ability to go out and start four or five different businesses and have them be wildly successful but to be called as a pastor means if you don't do it, you know you're in direct rebellion and sin to God. And I think that's the only way to approach, approach pastoral ministry. You know, we look at the Bible at Jonah, who ran away from his calling to preach. We look in the Bible at Elijah, who wanted to kill himself after preaching. We look in the Bible at Jeremiah, who wanted to shut up, never preach again, and was wildly depressed. And we look at these men and we we pull out these lessons of don't run away from God, right? Of, of don't kill yourself. And <laughs> And of, of, of don't deny your calling. And, and no doubt those things are true. I'm not saying to ignore that. But what I'm saying is there's something there. There's something uniquely there that that's the kind of person that should be a pastor. It's like a politician, right? It's like what kind of person wants to be a politician besides a narcissistic psychopath, right? <laughs> and no offense, like if you are or you're in politics, but, but if you are, you probably understand where I'm going with that, right? But it's like, what kind of person says, I can lead? <laughs> right? like, like, like what kind of person says, I can be a pastor? I can direct you closer to God. I can be, and that's why the Bible says there's a stricter judgment on those that teach the word of God, because what you're saying is, I can be the thing that helps you 
get closer to and look more like Jesus. And what do we have? We have a generation of people leaving the church in droves. And so it's like, there's, there's going to be some judgment there. You should not want to be a pastor. If you're a pastor, you should do it because you can absolutely not do anything else without feeling like, like you're disobeying God. Okay, off my soapbox. <laughs> that role looks different for other churches, though. And we have to realize that. That some churches hold the office of pastor a, a lot more conservatively and literally to what the Bible talks about, which is kind of like being a shepherd, right? Which is this very in-depth, involved in, in the, the flock, as it were, and involved in the lives of the congregation, right? That you are probably 70 or 80 percent of the time a counselor you know you're 70 or 80 percent of the time someone who just interprets scripture one-on-one -on -one across a table from a member of the congregation and then the other 10 percent of the time you run the business of the church right you you handle the the i don't know if i can think of a better word but the, the kind of corporate obligations of what it means to run a church and then you teach like a small percentage of the time right like being a pastor in so many churches isn't isn't just about teaching in a stage but so many churches that's all it is like like that's literally it if like if the church says you're a pastor you get to spend 40 hours a week at a full-time job just studying and preparing to teach for three hours on a sunday right? and maybe an hour on a saturday like depending on the church and it's like, if that's your definition, fine. That's not super in line with the biblical definition of what being a pastor means. And so maybe that doesn't apply. Maybe maybe biblically you're fine and a woman can, can be in that role of pastor. But there's something there that Paul is saying that we can't overlook. And so I think maybe because we don't know the full answer, maybe we just have some grace. Maybe if, if we see someone in a different denomination and they say women can't be pastors, we understand that they're saying something different than what you're saying when you say women can be a pastor. And maybe, maybe the, other, the other side is true too, right? Maybe if you meet someone who is a woman pastor in a different denomination from your own and, and who has a different theological and, and maybe even seminary background than you, and, and she says, hey, I'm a woman pastor, maybe, maybe we just give her some grace and, and we realize that we're from different places culturally. We're from different denominations theologically. And this isn't a salvation issue. It's not to say that, it, like, that if you think women can be pastors or if you're, you are a woman pastor, like you're somehow less saved or more saved or, or whatever, right? It's, it's, it's a different issue. And the Bible's not entirely clear on it. But it's clear that there's something there worth considering. Uh, those are my thoughts on it. <laughs> Let me know your thoughts on it. Um, feel free to send me an email, uh, drop a comment in some of the platforms that the show is posted on that can hold comments, and don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Um, I noticed that there are some reviews popping up on some of the different forms and, and places that you can access this show, and those really help. Uh, I read those. I love to see your feedback. Uh, I love it. It's it's the biggest compliment in the world, and, and and I love it when you guys write in and, and or message me and say, hey, I shared this podcast with, with a friend or a coworker or a family member and, and they're, they're eating it up and they love it or maybe they hate it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. Maybe they hate it. Um, but it's the biggest compliment in the world when you guys share this show, uh, whether you agree with me or not, because I'm just here to start a conversation as I always introduce myself. But as always, thank you so much for listening and I hope you've enjoyed the show. Hey, thank you so much for watching this on YouTube. Um, I hope it was a joy and not a curse to see my face for the 20 whatever minutes that this podcast episode went on for. If you like this format, I'm just trying something different here, seeing what sticks, uh, let me know. Drop a comment, leave a like, definitely subscribe, check out the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, wherever good podcasts are found, and uh, great to see you guys. Catch you next episode.